anybody's door. I knocked on their door and uh, stopped at, at any house and, and just talked to whoever happened to uh, step out and invite them to church. What do you suppose they tell us? I'm sorry? Yeah, they go to church somewhere else. Too busy. Don't believe in it. Right. They don't believe. They don't believe in it. I like that. And don't believe in church. <laughs> so, anything else? How is church going to help them? Yeah. What's the church going to do for me? And there's nothing wrong with that. What else? They've already been there. And uh, depending on what church they went to, uh, it might dictate how likely they are to come back. Yeah. Those are all right answers, in my opinion. And I've, I have done some of that, and I've heard some of those answers. Um, probably of all of those, the one that I've heard the most is, I, I would come if I weren't so busy. And, and that's a very polite um, answer, I think, to give anybody who invites us to go to church. And that's what makes them a lot like the person that we read about in, in this passage. Uh, Zacchaeus, being a tax collector, more than a tax collector, is the chief tax collector, which means he's an employer. And since he's rich, well, he's successful. And so if he says, I'm too busy, well, we believe him. He probably is. But people won't always tell you exactly why they wouldn't come to church. <coughs> And they might mutter something like, well, I wouldn't feel comfortable there. But that would just be the first layer of an excuse <coughs> as to why they wouldn't go to church. To find out their real reason, you'd have to go deeper than that. And ask yourself, well, why wouldn't people feel comfortable coming to church? They're not going to tell you. They just won't. You don't know them well enough. You're a stranger. You just knock on their door. And there's no way they're going to let you know why they wouldn't feel comfortable coming to church. But somewhere deep inside, they have a reason. Even if they don't know it themselves, they have a reason. And more often than not, I'm pretty well convinced that that reason is shame. Because you see, all of us have lived long enough to do things that make us, if we hadn't been to church before, to think of church as some place of perfect people, of righteous people. Because after all, we get dressed up to come to church. We're supposed to be close to God when we come to church. And people have this vague sense that God is holy. And they have this, this feeling about us that somehow because we're in church, we actually are better than them. Not that we think we are, but that we are. And that makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, Zacchaeus was a rich man. And Zacchaeus um, was a part of a profession that was kind of suspect. And I've actually known IRS people today who would not put their numbers in the phone book. Uh, they worked in relation to the IRS in such a way that uh, 
they actually got some bad phone calls. And uh, when they retired, they, they actually tried to make up for some of that by helping people uh, who were less fortunate uh, to not be harassed by the IRS. And I'm not saying that anybody who works for the Internal Revenue Service is a lot to live down, but I am saying that we can know something about what is going on with him. People actually had to pay Zacchaeus, poor farmers did, to move their produce from one part of town to another. He was someone who was businessman enough to uh, buy a license to tax people and to tax his own people. And John the Baptist himself had a word of admonition for tax collectors, take no more than the allotted amount for you. And so he is a successful man. And he is a prominent man. But a lot of people hate him. And so he has his reasons, maybe, for not feeling comfortable in church. And we wouldn't know that if we didn't know him. And if we weren't already members of this church, already someone who'd gone to this church all our lives, we might not, we might be like Zacchaeus in as much as that we might not be able to see Jesus through the crowd. Now the crowd that was following Jesus over the centuries became the church. And that church over the centuries gradually became an institution. And an institution, of course, is an organization uh, established for the service of humanity. And a religious institution is just, well, it's no better, no worse. It's just an institution or an organization for the service of God. But it isn't better for being religious because a crowd slowly becomes like a brick wall. And the problem is still the basic problem that people who aren't used to coming to church have to see through that institution in order to see Jesus. Because everything we have around us that is so familiar to us is here to point us to God. But over time, all these symbols and all this organization has become something that people have to see through in order to see God. You know, we can identify with Zacchaeus, but there's another character in the story, and that is the crowd. That's the crowd of people who say, he's going to have dinner with that man who is a sinner. And you can imagine, you know, Zacchaeus runs to get into that tree. He climbs up on that branch, places himself in Jesus' path. But he's really hiding in plain sight. Because while he is in Jesus' path, he's also standing on a limb of a tree that is not in Jesus' line of sight. And so he can't be expecting to hear what he hears as he's patiently watching Jesus make his way down the road. But he hears his name. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus. And everybody knows who Zacchaeus is. He's the tax collector. He's that very wealthy man. Zacchaeus, come down. Hurry down because I have to go to your house today. And so he does. But that moment of elation, I think, becomes a moment of shame as soon as his feet hit the ground. Because as soon as, it, as he hits the ground, he hears those words. 
Those words sidle through that crowd like a snake in the grass. And what does it say? He stood there. He just stood there. Suppose that were us. Suppose it were you. And you heard that. He's going to the house of the sinner. And you catch that. And you know who you are. And you know that everyone in that crowd knows who you are. And so, elation turns to shame. But he stands there. And he says to Jesus, I'm willing to give half of what I own to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone, I'm willing to pay them back four times as much. And it is at that very moment that salvation <coughs> comes to this house. It's at that moment when we stand there and know that God loves us no matter what anyone else thinks of us, no matter what anybody says about us, in that moment when we are most willing to change, salvation has come to our house. You know, it's not just children who play hide and seek. Adults do that too. And we put ourselves in places where we can be found. Everyone we know has put themselves, put themselves in that place. And if we're really looking behind the shame, then we'll see. Then we'll know. So salvation comes to this house when we're able to stand there and when we're willing to listen to what people are really saying to us. In the game of hide and seek, the, pers the first person to be found is the next person to seek. And if we are willing to play that game here, if we're willing to come out of hiding here, <coughs> to show ourselves as we are, then we'll be capable of seeking the lost. And that's what we're called to do. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you would bless those that are seeking to be found. Lord, give us the courage we need to push past their resistance, their excuses, to even push past their shame because we faced our own. Help us, Lord, to become a community that's capable of reaching the community. In Christ's name.